joining us today for the 83rd film lecture. Um, my name is Brad Pino. I'm the assistant professor of silviculture here in the Department of Regional Resources, and I'll be the MC for our uh, afternoon today. So thank you all for, uh, for joining us. So the University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the history, languages, and culture of the First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. So I'm hoping that some of you would have had a chance to stop at the poster session on the way over here. So if you don't know, there's a poster session of all of our graduate students and all the great work that they're doing. Um, we had it before the lecture over in Ag4, and we'll continue on after the lecture here back in Ag4 on the main floor. So if you didn't get a chance before the lecture, please join us afterwards at the, uh, at the poster presentation. So like I mentioned, this is the 83rd Forest Industry Lecture. And we don't get to 83 lectures without great support from our sponsors. So um, I would just like to take a second here and acknowledge all of the, uh, all the wonderful sponsors that we do have. So the Association of Alberta Forest Management Professionals, Alberta Forest Products Association, Alberta Pacific Forest Industries, Altus Group, ANC Timber, Canadian Forest Products, the Canadian Institute of Forestry Rocky Mountain Section, Carson Integrated, DLA Piper, Earth Econ, Envirostat Solutions, Forecorp Solutions, Forest Soil Science, Foresight Consultants, FP Innovations, FRI Research, Green Lane Forestry, Incremental Forest Technologies, the Lornell Group, Miller Western Forest Products, MNPLLD, Natural Resources Canada Northern Forestry Centre, Norboard, PwC Canada, Silvicon, Tolco Industries, Vanderbilt Contractors, West Fraser Mills, Warehouser Company, and Wild and Pine. So please join me in thanking all of our great sponsors. <laughs> Good afternoon all, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thanks Dr. Pino for the introduction and thank you to certainly you as attendees but also to all of our sponsors who really supported us and Brad's absolutely right. This is how we get to 83 by such strong support that all of you provide. It seems like my modus over the last several lectures has been always to ask you a little opening question. World Forest Day is coming up soon. Do they know what date World Forest Day is going to be celebrated? Well done, 21st of March. Very clever uh, person from a particular form of government there. Welcome, thank you very much. So you're, so all kinds of ways to amplify our stories, right? That's what we think about as a faculty. Certainly that's what we think about in departments like renewable resources or resource economics and environmental sociology. Just have to bring you up to speed on a few things. What are we celebrating this year? 50 years of the forestry program here at the University of Alberta. There are a number of things that are going on. There's a family summer barbecue in Whitecourt on Sunday, August 16th. Uh, check in early. There will be a whole series of alumni events going on during our alumni weekend, which is uh, 18th to 20th of September. And certainly between a number of our colleagues uh, uh, with advancement, I know Cynthia Strassen has been very involved in, in uh, an amazing calendar that we put together, Catherine, Oh, uh, Cynthia's right there, as a matter of fact. Just in time delivery, well done. Uh, so please, if you have other ideas or thoughts or you want to get a sense of everything else that's going on in our celebration of this 50 year, please feel free to talk to uh, Cynthia. Have some great news. This is also a, a celebration and really, again, showing just the collaboration and partnership of our so many of our industry partners. We have commitments now from a whole array of partners. You just heard Brad read off a long list. I'm not going to do that for this. For a new assistant or associate professor as an endowed chair in forest growth and yield. This is just an amazing coming together of, of, of just a remarkable group of companies uh, and others to make this work. 
We're advertising right now and hope to have someone in place uh, by the next school year. So there will be a, a formal announcement and a broader acknowledgement of just all of the good things that have come about at our next bills that will come up in November. Another piece of celebration, we're happy to announce that Dr. Charles Nock has received his NSERC Industrial Research Chair and in ecosystem-based forest management. And he'll be uh, starting that piece of it in, in spring. So I think a round of applause for Dr. Nock. <laughs> just need to tell you the, the superb support of LPAC, of Canfor, of Freya, of Mercer, Tolco, Weyerhaeuser, West Fraser, along with provincial and federal governments were just, uh, every piece of that was crucial to make sure that we were successful in getting this IRT. So that's a great uh, step forward. And I have also indoctrinated Dr. Knott in using a fountain pen in the last <laughs> three months. So it's victory for all of us somehow in, uh, in uh, this uh, side of the world. Renewable Resources has just been a remarkable department with all kinds of good things going on. This year, we're somewhere around $11 million in external funding, support to almost 200 <coughs> graduate students, many of them that I know are in the room right now. And certainly our faculty uh, continues to think about how we do the things that we need to do. We talk about enriching the student experience of connecting, of connecting science, turning science into solutions, connecting to our communities, uh, very much still front of mind in everything that we do with your communities and several others. And we're working very hard to increase uh, our enrollment in our undergraduate programs of forestry, of forest business management, of uh, ENCS, of environmental and conservation sciences. So lots of those things going on, and I and I love the connectivity. So uh, I know that the Reese Group participates very actively in training those undergraduates, just as well as courses out of uh, renewable resources and so many others. It really shows the integrated nature of the way that our faculty and the way that these programs work. And I would just uh, uh, have to acknowledge as well, you all know that Dr. Ellen McDonald is the department chair of renewable resources. In addition to last year's IUPRO uh, uh, Science Award, Science Research Award, this year, uh, Dr. McDonald was, uh, was given, identified as the University Cup winner, our absolutely highest academic award within this university. So I think a round of applause. what the trifecta is going to be in all of this, but I think top two is uh, very much a double header, more than adequate at this stage. Uh, just to also remind you that uh, the next Renew is coming out. It'll come out, I think, in May or June of this year. And uh, uh, since I just uh, mentioned her, I will uh, ask you to again welcome uh, Dr. McDonald to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Stan. I'll just stand here and shout and you can all hear me. It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Shane Berg as our 83rd Bill speaker. I think it's very fitting that in this, our 50th anniversary of our forestry program, we have one of our own alumni coming back to share his wisdom with us. So I'm extremely pleased that he's here. Uh, Shane grew up in Edmonton. He tells me he was a city kid who didn't really know much about forestry, but he liked being outdoors. And that's what attracted him to our program here. Um, his uncle was actually Dr. Roy Berg, who was dean of the faculty at that time. And he reassures me that he gave him absolutely no grades as an undergrad. <laughs> <laughs> he was a tough guy. Um, so as an undergrad, Shane actually uh, got some summer employment with the Northern Forestry Center, CFS, here in town, learned a little bit about research. And that helped him, helped him after he graduated with his BSc in forestry. His first job was with uh, Syncrude. So that, that, that's yeah, working back to what happened with a few forestry students a few years ago. I uh, went into the oil patch, but uh, he was trying to figure out how to grow forests on oil sands tailings, something we're still trying to figure out how to do. Uh, but then pretty quickly, he found his way back into the core discipline of forestry with the job with the Alberta government, and then he and his uh, wife decided to move to BC to start their lives together, and he landed a job in Invermere, which I have to say is a pretty fine place to land for a job in BC. I'd be happy to land there. And uh, since then, he spent uh, 30 years working with BC's public service. Uh, his career has encompassed the full breadth of forestry and beyond, but he tells me that silviculture is still his deep passion and he still loves to go out into the forest, go to a site, see what people are doing, and ask them 
why they're doing it and how it's working for them. Uh, uh, we had a nice dinner last night and he was describing to me what a passion he has for forests and for the practice of forestry and in particularly he has a passion and drive to attract more young people into this uh, amazing career opportunity. Um, considering the many challenges we face today, Shane says that we have never been more important to manage our forests in a sustainable and science-based manner. So I'm very much looking forward to this talk and please join me and welcome Shane Burke. Ellen, that was a fantastic um, introduction, and I've learned that after uh, drinks at dinner, I should just shut up and not tell you anything, um, but thank you so much. And uh, apologies for the lights. I thought it would be best if my slides were that much more vibrant, and I have a colleague in the room from Tolco. Uh, Mr. Mark Thomas that says I look better in low light. <laughs> so, uh, so good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you, Ellen, for that uh, wonderful, uh, somewhat embellished uh, introduction. Um, it's nice to be back in Edmonton. As Ellen mentioned, I'm an Edmonton kid. I uh, grew up in Lendrum uh, near the Southgate Mall. Uh, went to Harry Ainley High School and uh, had parents who had a very... Um, uh, important role in my life to come to university. The, my father uh, attended uh, university, uh, agriculture graduate. I have four uncles who graduated from agriculture, and so I only had one uh, place to go uh, when I decided to go to university, and that was the U of A. Uh, thankfully, agriculture and forestry were blended at the time, so when I chose a, a, a career or a, a faculty of forestry, it blended with agriculture. Um, but it was a wonderful institution to go to and, and I've been spending lots of time talking to students and just saying this is a great place to go to school and, and uh, hoping that they have the, the fortitude to continue with their forestry degrees. Um, I have to say that it has been a lonely existence uh, these past years, being the only Edmonton Oiler fan in my entire ministry. Um, I am enjoying the last couple of weeks, and uh, I almost wore my McDavid jersey today. Um, and a huge shout out to uh, Christy Nohos, who has pretty much organized this entire trip for me. Uh, I know what it feels like to be a rock star now. Um, I asked for red only M&Ms in my dressing room. Uh, she said no, and then she pointed out that I didn't have a dressing room. So those were two. <laughs> Two important things. Um, I did some research in preparation for this talk. The first forest industry lecture took place in 1977. Uh, the inaugural guest speaker was, and I quote from the IFS website, the internationally respected forester, Dr. Ross Silversides. Internationally respected. So I have some big shoes to fill, and I'm hoping that the next hour uh, will do um, justice to uh, Dr. Silversides. Um, but just to give me an understanding of who I'm talking to in the room, I was hoping to just get a show of hands. How many people represent the forest industry here this afternoon? Thank you for coming. And uh, academics, not students. Excellent. And how about those students? Great. We need way more students in the natural resource sciences. You guys are going to hear this from me throughout the day. So the title of my presentation this afternoon is Challenges Facing Forest Management in BC. We are not alone. Uh, of course, uh, paying homage to the iconic uh, moniker used by Mulder in that famous um, television series, The X-Files, which when I mentioned to the fourth year class this morning, they all stared at me like a cow watching a train, <laughs> which didn't make me feel that uh, young. Uh, but my apologies for any of you that think there's going to be a UFO reference, there will not be. So uh, Ellen was kind enough to mention my origins. Here is my graduating class of 1985. There I am. Um, and what is so uh, amazing to me is the individuals in the upper uh, row, uh, the professors, the doctors that uh, helped us uh, actually attain our goals. Yes, my uncle was dean at the time which didn't do a thing for me, I have to say. Uh, but I'm very pleased uh, to recognize uh, both Dr. Beck and Dr. Murphy are here this afternoon. Gentlemen, 
raise your hands? Can we give them a hand? <laughs> Dr. Murphy came in and said, um, Shane, I didn't know you graduated. <laughs> it's nice to have that recognition. And of course, I can't uh, come to a session without showing you the picture that's on my mom's wall. A little known fact, I won the Warehouser Canada Bursary for a graduate with the best hair. <laughs> an award that was soon removed. But more importantly, ladies and gentlemen, um, I was the guy that brought bear country to the U of A Gateway newspaper. Yes, I'm the guy that drew this cartoon for four years. Take that, internationally respected Dr. Ross Silversides. <laughs> Let's see him draw a cartoon. Anyway, um, show of hands, anybody know Bear Country? Anybody seen it ever? Thank you. <laughs> There's going to be money at the end. But in all uh, seriousness, um, when I talk about my time at the university and I talk about young people, um, I asked the fourth year class this morning why they took forestry. Uh, a lot of them said for job opportunities, a lot of them said they wanted to work outdoors. So I gave them an example of a real life example of what took place in my life. I have uh, three daughters. My favorite daughter went to the U of A <laughs> and she graduated with an education degree. So I go to that convocation ceremony, a thousand teachers, would be teachers walk across the stage. 500 elementary school, 500 high school. And uh, I flipped to the syllabus to find out what the forestry class is going to look like. And can anyone guess how many grads were graduating that year? Shout it out. Ten. Eight. Eight graduates. So I, in talking to the fourth year class this morning, I told them this story. And I said, eight graduates, that is... That is uh, untenable. We cannot continue to have eight graduates. And then uh, one of the students said, Shane, we have six this year. <laughs> now, we need more grads, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and we need more grads because here's a graph. Unfortunately, it's uh, not going to be easily seen, but this is the uh, forest lands natural resource numbers for the entire ministry. Average age is 37.4 years old. I work for the Office of the Chief Forester. Our average age is 48.8 .8 years old. It'll be three years before I get there. I'm kidding. <laughs> but thank you for assuming that was correct. I did get the Best Air Award, obviously. Um, so this is a demographic that we deal with each and every day. And this is why I think we need more youth, more young people going into forestry. And frankly, I think this is a challenge that we are not alone in, regardless of the province you're in. We need more young people. Uh, just for information's sake, and I'm happy to announce that I have a niece applying to the faculty of Ailes, um, Victoria Berg, B-E-R-G, Ellen, <laughs> just, in, just in case. So enough of my trip down memory lane, ladies and gentlemen. Here's what we're going to uh, talk about this afternoon. Um, areas of challenge that I think we share. Uh, areas of challenge both in BC and, and somewhat in Alberta. I recognize that some of these influences we share uh, with our Alberta counterparts uh, may not be completely across the nation. Uh, some of these are going to be unique to BC, but for the most part, I would say that BC is not alone in trying to address these challenges. Um, I uh, used the Rubik's Cube as the puzzle that we're trying to uh, solve. Again, the fourth years didn't know what I was talking about. I thought I should have used an iPhone with me trying to uh, program it as the puzzle. <laughs> so for those of you who uh, only visit BC when you're pulling your uh, wakeboard boat into your cabin at Shushwap Lake, let me uh, remind you of what the province looks like. Uh, BC is 95 million hectares in size. Just over half of that is covered by forests, or 57 million hectares. Of that 57 million hectares, 22 million uh, is available to harvest. We call that the timber harvesting land base. 
Each year we harvest about 1% of that, so 200,000 hectares. Based on market influences, shutdowns, etc., our long-term harvest level is probably going to be around 57 million cubic meters per year. That is problematic. And this is not something I think that we're alone in. So here's a map showing the forest-dependent communities in BC. The darker the green shows the more dependency that the communities have for forestry. Highest contribution is in Prince George. Our GDP in forestry is around 6.9 billion a year. And our jobs are around 50,000. I don't think we're alone in recognizing the importance of the forest industry to the province's well-being. So let's talk about forest health, one of the first challenges. Spruce beetle is taking over uh, from mountain pine beetle. The mountain pine beetle's kind of moved on. Um, you're welcome. <laughs> I know we're sending it, <laughs> sending it in your direction. Uh, this is around Prince George. You can see the infestations that were prevalent in 2018. The challenge is, is that it's sparse. And it's kind of that what we refer to as salt and pepper. Uh, it's difficult to salvage individually, but in some cases it's the last vestige of um, timber in these areas. So as I said, here's what it looks like in Prince George. You can see that kind of salt and pepper infestation. It's going to be very difficult to take out individual trees, but it is prevalent. And really, when you look at this landscape, you've got regeneration that was uh, put in place following the mountain pine beetle salvage. So we've got regeneration that's probably 15 to 20 years old. And then all this red attack in the spruce. Now, we've got communities, as I said, that are suffering. We've got sh uh, sawmills that are shutting down. We're getting asked to ensure or to see if we can go in and take out this uh, impacted spruce. The challenge that we have is, of course, if you take out this last vestige of timber, all your corridors are gone, all your wildlife connectivity, some of the riparian protection that we're depending upon in the streams. So this is the challenge. Uh, how do you address a forest health concern such as this and still maintain the integrity and the sustainability of the forest in these areas? Um, I don't think we're alone in answering these types of questions. So you haven't had a forestry uh, presentation without graphs and charts. So this shows the spruce beetle. As you can see, it was uh, had its peak in 2017, uh, went down in 2018, and is back up in 2019. And as I said, it's mostly in the interior part, central interior of our province. The western bark beetle, about 2.5 million hectares were impacted this year. Uh, attack rates have been increasing since 2013. This is more high elevation in BC, and so it doesn't have the same potential impact as the uh, Doug fir, the spruce, and the pine, but it is still increasing. Doug fir beetle, we've got less than 100,000 hectares impacted last year, a slight decrease from the year before. But its increase in mortality has primarily been associated with drought and host susceptibility due to wildfire. And of course, we can't uh, have a lecture on forestry without talking about the, the mountain pine beetle. I'm happy to report that most of our mountain pine beetle problems have uh, left the building. Um, we've seen mountain pine beetle damage consistently decline since its peak in 2007, with only about 10,000 hectares expected this year. It's still active, but we're only seeing between 10 and 20,000 hectares a year. So this graph shows uh, sort of the beetle impacts across BC were pretty steady state and endemic until around 2000. And that's when we saw a, dra a, a rapid increase in the mountain pine beetle. Uh, the peak of the mountain pine beetle attack was in 2005. And in this graph, you can see the darker red is where the mountain pine beetle severity was the most. There's Prince George, uh, Williams Lake. 
So tremendous infestation in this central part of the province. I ask you to keep this graph in mind as we talk about wildfire. Uh, but again, I think infestations and damage to forests are something that we're not alone in. So we can't talk about forest management challenges without mentioning the effect that our hotter summers are having on drought. I was talking to uh, some faculty members uh, uh, earlier today and yesterday, and drought is certainly something that Alberta has been experiencing. We are not alone on that front. Uh, two successive summers of drought conditions in 2017 and 2018 affected vast areas of southern BC, impacting both mature and immature uh, trees. On the coast, uh, our western red cedar is starting to become extirpated from the southeastern Vancouver Island area and the Gulf Islands just because of drought. I don't think we're alone in that, in that situation. So what are we doing about forest health in BC? Well, we're really trying to do early and correct identification of the incidents and the risk. We can no longer afford to just go ahead and clear cut hundreds of hectares to get 20 hectares of infestation. We carry out aerial overview surveys every year. It's expensive but necessary. We follow that up with low-level helicopter surveys to fine-tune our data and really understand what's causing the damage and how much of it there is. Again, expensive. And of course, nothing beats ground surveys. Uh, you can't get better information than you can from the ground, but it is a vast province and we can't get to all the hectares every year. So possible options with our industry when it comes to forest health. Um, a number of the hardest hit spruce beetle areas in the central part of the province are miles away from the nearest road network. Uh, very expensive to develop. Um, so maybe access upgrades or, or uh, access being uh, looked after by other entities can help. Redirecting our licensees into some of these affected areas to ensure that we're getting value from these trees before they, they fall off. Stumpage incentives, partial harvesting options, uh, partition orders, which is focusing our harvesting into certain uh, timber profiles or an allowable annual cut uplift or some other ideas. Small scale salvage, especially around communities, might be a way of dealing with it. And our BC timber sales program, which is kind of our market logging government agency, uh, can also focus its, uh, its um, operations in those areas. So I'm excited to share with you some of the work that's being done by CANFOR and Parks Canada uh, to deal with the mountain pine beetle in parks. So when you talk about parks, and for those of you that um, are talking with neighbors or at a barbecue and you mention the possibility of perhaps harvesting in a park, you'll usually get a drink tossed in your face or some, some uh, angry neighbors. But here was an opportunity where uh, CANFOR and Parks Canada um, we're looking at thousands of hectares of mountain pine beetle damaged timber surrounding the town of Jasper and it was creating a huge risk for the people in the town. So the objective was to reduce the canopy fuel density to decrease the fire risk while maintaining ecological integrity. So Parks Canada laid out uh, some guidelines around coarse woody debris retention and um, areas of wildlife tree patches, etc. And approximately 300 hectares of impacted pine stands uh, were logged with retention of aspen and spruce. Large quartz wordy debris, as I said, was left behind. Harvesting was completed last winter. And this is what it looks like today. So it doesn't look bad. I mean, there's lots of harvesting that certainly are making a fire break. But there, you've still got this. You've still got red. It's not going to be... Uh, the fulsome way of addressing it. But this is a paradigm shift, ladies and gentlemen. This is an opportunity to say, is there something we can do about battling the mountain pine beetle in parks where we've actually absolutely been, been uh, told that we can't harvest commercially? It's a paradigm shift, but I think it's something that we're not in, alone in trying to assume can have value. So you can't... Um, talk about jasper and mountain pine beetle harvest without talking about wildfire. The combination of climate change and the aftermath of the insect outbreaks created a perfect storm in 2017 and 18. And I know Alberta is no stranger to wildfire impacts. Remember that uh, graph that I showed you before. So the dark purple areas, the darker the purple, 
is uh, the highest degree of mountain pine beetle infestation. And the uh, dark red were the fires in 2017, and the dark purple were the fires in 2018. Now we did have some fires up in the northern part of the province, but again, concentrations of the fires around mountain pine beetle are certainly showing that that infestation is having long-term effects on our province, on the resources and the safety of communities. Something that I know we're not alone in trying to address. So over two and a half million hectares were burned over those two fire seasons. Um, thankfully, human-caused fires dropped from 40% to 25% over the two years. And we're hoping that was because of the Fire Smart program and people becoming more aware. We've been trying to hit the fires hard and hit them fast, but suppression costs were still over $1.3 billion. These are not funds that BC has readily, and I know we're not alone in that regard. So more uh, fire photos that we've all seen before. Um, interestingly enough, lots of aspen patches left behind. This asks the question, should we be planting more aspen? Should we be ensuring that there's more deciduous as a fire mitigation opportunity? And when you look at huge landscapes, this is near Williams Lake, you've got um, immature stands affected, you've got uh, plantations that haven't yet achieved free growing impacted, you've got mature timber, you've got vast areas of burning, and then you've got these patches in amongst the mature timber and the regeneration. It is a puzzle ladies and gentlemen, to manage this kind of landscape after a wildfire. And after the catastrophic fires we've had in 2017-18, I know it's not something that we are alone in trying to address. And there's more damage that takes place after a fire. Here's a great example. Uh, the fire damage is in the middle. And what you can see is that this red and the uh, damage taking place outside of it isn't the fire. It's drought and Douglas fir beetle. So again, additive impacts following fires. So what is BC doing about the wildfire impacts? Well, we're um, embarking upon a community resiliency initiative for impacted communities, uh, ensuring that there's community wildfire risk reduction in place. We're also looking at research. Uh, we're also uh, incorporating research into stocking densities, the use of deciduous, pre-commercial thinning, as means of mitigating uh, fire spread and fire behavior. I know we're not alone in trying to find ways of mitigating wildfire impacts. And I know we're not alone in applying the right kind of research and there's some tremendous talent at the University of Alberta that's working on this and also in BC. So another challenge. I'm not using this slide to provoke debate or to get people talking about whether it's right or wrong. Uh, this is more to introduce the fact that we need to develop relationships, long-term meaningful relationships with First Nations and Indigenous communities to carry out natural resource management across the land base. Um, without that, we're going to consistently be in conflict. We're going to consistently be seeing stoppages and uh, unfortunate events. I know the licensees in the room, uh, the forest industry uh, folks know that uh, you don't get anywhere without a relationship. And in BC, we have the added complexity of having uh, 203 First Nations uh, whose traditional territory overlap uh, to a degree of 110%. So if each of the First Nations traditional territory was converted to title lands, it would cover the province 110%. Uh, we need to continue to work with First Nations in a meaningful way, uh, work to understand uh, their issues and also their um, uh, indigenous knowledge in application of forest management. Uh, BC recently passed the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. Uh, so we are taking the principles of UNDRIP and applying it into an act. We are working with First Nations to understand how that will be implemented across the province. But we are not alone in our pursuit of better dialogue in achieving reconciliation with First Nations. Now you can't talk about BC without thinking about old growth. Uh, approximately 33% of old growth in BC is protected. Um, there are a lot of folks that don't think that's enough. There are uh, an equivalent number of folks that think that, that it's more than enough. 
So how do we define it? Where is it located? How much do we need to protect and where? How much is enough? And how much is actually left? These are all questions that we are uh, managing uh, to try and answer in, in, in uh, looking after our old growth forests. Um, but it's not that simple. Um, any of you that have uh, taken a trip to Port Alberni or Tofino will know Cathedral Grove, uh, a park, a provincial park. I think it was donated by Macmillan Blodell way back in the, uh, when Dr. Beck was um, a younger person. And uh, um, when you go through Cathedral Grove, um, what you'll notice is uh, a lot of the old growth Douglas fir are blowing down. Uh, they're breaking off. Uh, we've got a tremendous amount of blowdown in this park now. And I think it, um, what I've referred to it as this old growth forest is starting to show its age. Um, you've got lots of broken tops and, and uh, slash that's uh, six to eight feet tall. Um, when does an old growth forest no longer act like an old growth forest? When is it not exhibiting attributes that truly are intended to match the objectives for old growth? These are the kind of questions that we're asking. I'm not sure that Alberta has the same sort of leg legacy forest issues that we do, uh, but I know that um, we have to manage some of our forests differently and we have to ask the question, um, are these forests doing what they were intended to do? And if not, is there some other use that we can have for these forests? Another forest management challenge is how we're managing our species at risk. The Salto and West Moberly First Nations have partnered with the federal and provincial government to protect Southern Mountain Caribou in Northeastern BC in a, in a historic agreement. 700,000 hectares of important caribou habitat have been designated. And uh, this expands on an area that was only 34,000 uh, hectares in size previously. The forest industry is concerned. Uh, they think that it's going to have a permanent removal of a significant amount of fiber from the timber harvesting land base and cre creates additional operational uncertainty. There are 250 animals in this particular area. The goal is to try and get those numbers up to 2,000 animals <laughs> in the next uh, 20 years or so. And only at that time will hunting by First Nations be allowed. Um, there's a lot of opinions about species at risk, um, but it is a challenge. And I know it's a challenge that we are not alone in trying to uh, address. So the culmination of all these influences, ladies and gentlemen, is reducing our allowable annual cut in BC. In 2010, the provincial AAC was around 83 million cubic meters per year. Before all the decisions to increase harvest to deal with mountain pine beetle were made, um, around mountain pine beetle salvage, the provincial allowable annual cut was just over 70 million. And then this year, we're estimating that our provincial AAC will be somewhere around 57 million. So that is the decline. And this is the long-term provincial estimate, somewhere around 57 million cubic meters. So this is going to challenge our forest industry. Uh, these are the background influences that um, we've been experiencing the last 12 months. Now, I'm not uh, an industry uh, economic expert, but I do know that uh, lumber prices were hovering around 450,000, or 450, wouldn't that be great? $450 uh, per 1,000 board feet. In October, they were just over 300 per 1,000 board feet. In May of 2018, they were hovering around $600 per 1,000 board feet. Now, my BC industry colleagues tell me that for some mills, it's around a $400 break-even point. Um, and so when I talked to my Alberta counterparts and I had lunch with a couple of government colleagues, they were telling me that salvage rates in some parts of Alberta are around $1.80 to $1.90 a cubic meter. Um, in some parts of BC, our licensees are spending between $50 and $80 per cubic meter for salvage. Um, I think there's a reason that uh, companies are operating uh, with a little more uh, certainty in Alberta based on that. But this is a challenge that we're dealing with and, and having to deal with in BC, and, and absolutely we're not alone in that regard. So allow me to do a bit of a quick poll. How many of you in the room think that our forests are being influenced by climate change? Okay. 
Um, whether you're in California, Australia, Fort McMurray, or Quesnel, we are not alone when it comes to climate change. Australia uh, was hit hard, as you all know, this past uh, winter, their summer. At least 10.3 million hectares burned, estimated billion animals killed, and 400 million tons of carbon dioxide emitted. Uh, still not convinced. Uh, I'm not an expert on elephants as the Deputy Chief Forester for BC, but I can tell you that 55 elements dying from a lack of food in Zimbabwe means a little something. Um, something that is closer to my attention is I heard on the CBC just the other day that uh, they've done a study on ski hills in Canada. Uh, the University of Waterloo Climate Change Department uh, estimates that in the next 50 years, uh, many ski hills in North America will not be able to meet their 100-day minimum operating season to be able to keep operating. And if you don't have snowmaking, you're not going to be a ski hill. Uh, this is significant for me, I'll tell you, but it is something that we have to keep in mind. So what are we doing to address these problems? I thought there'd be more booing. <laughs> That's right. So um, Canada has announced a program to plant 2 billion trees to capture massive amounts of CO2. According to scientists, planting billions of trees across the world is by far the biggest and cheapest way to tackle climate crisis. The uh, Swiss scientists are saying that uh, even with existing cities and farmland, there's enough space for new trees to cover 9 million square kilometers, roughly the size of the United States. Those new trees could suck up nearly 750 billion tons of heat-trapping carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, about as much carbon pollution as humans have spewed in the last 25 years. But is it that simple? Two billion trees rolls off the tongue pretty simply. Where are we going to put these trees? I know that when I flew from Calgary to Edmonton yesterday, there seemed to be a lot of open area. <laughs> but I don't think that's where we're going to put them. Um, there's a lot of unproductive ground in BC and Alberta that could support some incremental forest growth. How do we get those trees established? What treatments are available to help survival and growth in these severe conditions? We are not alone in trying to find ways of reducing our carbon footprint. Um, I was on a conference call with the Assistant Deputy Minister of Forests here in Alberta and we've uh, got a cross Canada um, initiative to try and see how we're going to plant these two billion trees. The questions that come up are, do we have enough seed, do we have enough nursery space, do we have enough planters, uh, what's going to be um, the, re the reaction or the response if we have all this extra trees, all these extra trees to plant. For the licensees in the room that do a lot of reforestation, will it mean that their planting costs go up? Reforesting the fires in BC is a huge uh, issue. Uh, we call this our shark fin graph. Uh, the number of seedlings planted in 2019 was roughly 270 million. Planting costs have risen by about between 15 and 35 percent in that period. Seedling costs have risen from 5 to 15 percent. We're expecting approximately 320 million trees to be uh, sown or requested uh, this coming year. And likely in the next three to five years, we're projecting 280 to 300 million trees will be planted. So that is good news, but it's a challenge to find the seed, the planters, and the costs. And so we are not alone in trying to figure that out. We have a program in BC called the Forest for Tomorrow program. It was started in 2005 to deal with the fires and to focus on replanting areas that ordinarily um, would be hard to reestablish uh, because they would um, otherwise be, remain un unproductive. So we've done surveying, site preparation, planting, spacing, fertilization, and brushing. Um, we've done a lot of that work in addition to the normal reforestation we do. So this is one way of trying to address that. The Office of the Chief Forester is responsible for all the tree seed collected, extracted, and stored in the province. Uh, we have a state-of-the-art uh, tree seed extraction and storage facility in Surrey. We have two seed improvement research stations and five seed orchards, which are operated by the province. And um, we also have 97 seed orchards operated privately uh, with 117,000 parent trees. Um, Forest genetics is the most important thing we do. Um, that's what Ellen asked me to tell everybody here today. 
Uh, our seed orchards provide between 750 and 2,500 kilograms of seed annually. Um, we have 7.6 billion seedlings worth of seed stored at our Surrey Tree Seed Center. The seed is worth over $200 million. Licensees in BC must use genetically selected seed first. They have to go through our provincial system to order their seed, to grow their seedlings, so they have to use the Class A seed first, and only if the Class A seed lot isn't available do they get to use Class B seed. 70% of all the seedlings planted in BC today are grown using Class A seed, and by 2020, uh, we're hoping to achieve 75% uh, of, all, of all seedlings being uh, uh, sown from Class A seed. Um, our goal is to increase the genetic gain by these seedlings by an average of 20% by 2020. Um, in addition to our uh, seed uh, breeding program, we, we breed for um, growth and yield, but also for pest resistance. And we've set a target of 50% of all seeds sown by 2035 will be resistant to pests. So a big deal, you say. It's just seed. Well, here's some of my favorite slides. I don't know if you can see that, but the box on the right is a 10 kilogram box of spruce wild seed. Um, you're going to get 1.8 million seedlings out of it. This box is going to cost you $6,600, just about $6,700, which is expensive for seed. The box on the left is using a genetically selected seed from our Kalamalka orchard in Vernon. It's also 10 kilograms. It's only going to produce 1.4 million seedlings because the seeds are a little bigger. This box is going to cost $44,000. That's a great increase. But if you wanted to plant pine, Genetically improved pine, 10 kilograms, is going to cost you $85,000. This is the investment we're making in BC to try and get the right seed and the right <coughs> seedlings grown to get the best growth and yield on the provincial land base for all the reasons that forests are important. I know that we're not alone in producing the best seedlings in North America. I know that Alberta has a tremendous uh, history and uh, industry in that regard as well. But, as my slides before have shown, we're going to have to do more of it, and soon. So I can't be at the University of Alberta without talking about research. We have a tremendous uh, relationship uh, with the U of A researchers in BC. Um, we must continue to innovate and find new solutions to the challenges facing our forests across BC. Uh, the research program falls under the office of the Chief Forester. We have 70 research scientists across the province. Uh, doing everything from landscape uh, ecology to wildlife habitat. Uh, the research that we've been using has created Chief Forester's guidance on seed production, post-wildfire salvage and fire influence stocking standards, climate-based seed transfer guidelines, and we're also working on climate change informed species selection guidance. And I know we're not alone uh, when it comes to investing in forest and natural resource um, research for sure. So uh, here's some slides that the fourth years really enjoyed. We're also doing research with FP Innovations to uh, harvest steeper slopes. Uh, here's a tethered buncher. You can see the, the uh, cable that's keeping it from uh, going down the slope. And so that's allowing us to harvest safely on slopes that ordinarily we wouldn't be able to get to. An example of um, uh, winch technology, a forwarder with, with uh, tracks for less uh, soil damage with a winch that's helping it get to slopes that ordinarily would be either hand falling or avoiding, improving access to timber supply. You're all familiar with LIDAR, uh, ground LIDAR is being used now, <clears throat> pardon me, more um, than it has in the past, getting tremendous accuracy in determining um, the growth and yield and inventory information from our forests. And of course, something that um, uh, is being used a little bit uh, is the virtual uh, forest management opportunities using virtual reality to plan uh, forestry uh, harvesting. Uh, you can use this technology to actually see what your cut blocks may look like from various vantage points. I actually uh, sampled something uh, that a, a consultant was using that gave me a, 
uh, a look of what a cruise ship going past the inside passage would see along a coastal harvesting area. And we were able to manipulate the size of the cut block and the location of the block to lessen the amount of visual impact that would have. And you could actually hover at the, uh, the Lido deck um, height of the cruise ship and, and use that as a, a way of forest management. And finally, something that I think is a little harebrained, but drones planting trees. Um, I think the soils in Alberta and BC may not be quite as uh, amenable to that, but it is certainly technology that is out there and that is going to be given a look at. We're doing forest ecology work and research. This is Deb McCallop. Uh, she's a research ecologist in the Kootenai Boundary Country. This is what she gets to do every day, and this is what I showed the fourth years this morning. I said, you're going to be going into a job that gets you into these parts of the province doing this kind of work, and they pay you which is fantastic. Who wouldn't like to be doing this each and every day? I'll tell you something I wouldn't want to be doing each and every day, and that is um, putting radio collars on grizzly bears. This is uh, Dr. Bruce McClellan putting a radio collar on a grizzly bear in the Elk Valley to look at a grizzly bear habitat, where they, where they use the habitat, where they're uh, best found to help us with our forest management challenges. What I think is interesting about this uh, particular slide is the size of the bear's claws and the location of the conservation officer's gun. <laughs> so um, when it comes to climate change, we're attempting to address the forest carbon uh, circumstance with the forest carbon initiative in BC. There's a $290 million program that's been extended two years, and we're um, using that program to improve utilization, to reduce burning. Uh, incremental reforestation to fill plant to get more trees sequestering carbon, much like the two billion tree objective, and increasing our carbon sequestration through higher planting densities and fertilization. We're not alone in looking for ways of converting forest biomass into conventional products, cross laminated timber, stronger than conventional timber, or creating biofuels, bioplastics, or botanical forest products such as mushrooms taking forest um, products and the forest resources and converting them into food and medicines. These are new con uh, considerations. The forest industry is more than just producing two by fours. And I know that Alberta is looking at innovative ways to use your forests and, and especially some of your aspen forests. We're not alone in seeking innovation. So I thought you'd be interested in um, uh, two strategies that BC is doing. Um, our Premier announced the Coastal Forest Revitalization Strategy and the Interior Forest Renewal Strategy this past uh, year. The intended goals of the Interior Strategy, with I, which I thought would be more uh, prevalent to Alberta, is to um, uh, look at uh, addressing climate change impacted interior forests, looking at market shifts which are causing closures and curtailments, um, looking at ways of interior communities uh, to be the masters of their own design, uh, rationalize the number of mills in BC's interior and use more innovative and, uh, and uh, modern technologies and also reconcile the interest and opportunities that are out there. We have a Forest and Range Practices Act that guides everything that we do. It's in, been in place since 2000. Uh, numerous um, surveys, audits and public input has suggested that it needed changing, so we're changing it. Uh, we're changing parts of our Forest Act and we're changing parts of our Forest and Range Practices Act. Um, we're hoping that these changes are going to promote better planning, more public First Nation and stakeholder involvement up front, and frankly, better decision making overall. So one fundamental change to the Forest and Range Practices Act is we're putting in something called, uh, a new tool called a Forest Landscape Plan. And this is going to manage um, our forests over a much larger area. Uh, it's going to increase the scope of strategic planning. We're going to involve all the players in an area, First Nations, uh, forest industry, stakeholders at once. We are no longer going to piecemeal the planning of our forests into chart areas or operating areas. We're going to look at the entire landscape and we're going to do it far enough in advance that any of the uh, areas of, of um, uncertainty are going to be dealt with early and in time so that the forest uh, industry isn't hampered by last minute uh, decisions to halt permit approvals or to get in the way of their operations. 
This is a picture of a uniform landscape in Williams Lake. Uh, it's part of an old growth management area, so it is uh, deferred from harvesting. Uh, it is old Douglas fir. It's, it's older than what it should be because we've kept fire out of it. Um, we're using forest landscape planning as a means to maybe look at doing some entries into this landscape. Uh, going in and maybe being able to take out small openings, maybe creating a bit of more of a natural landscape if you had uh, allowed fire to go in, uh, possibly replacing those um, harvested areas with deciduous or doing some thinning. So it's a fire mitigative opportunity, but it's also mirroring what uh, Mother Nature would do uh, by itself. So that's certainly something we're trying to incorporate. So forest management isn't all that simple in BC. We're not alone in that regard. Forest managers are faced with questions of what do we do now each and every day. And yes, Dr. Beck, I drew that cartoon as well. And I'm going to leave you with um, a couple of points that I hope that uh, summarize uh, what I've been saying here over the last uh, almost hour. The decisions we make in our forests affect more than just trees and wildlife. They affect uh, entire communities. And frankly, they affect the world that is depending on our forests to provide products, habitat for wildlife, uh, and the things that are now extinct in other countries that we still enjoy. And perhaps, maybe even being a global carbon sink. Our forests are a critical resource and we are not alone and having the responsibility to manage them for future gener generations. So I'm going to leave you with a quote, and it might be a bit blasphemous to use this quote from a fellow from UBC, but this is from Dr. Fred Brunel, professor of wildlife ecology at UBC, when he said, forestry isn't rocket science, it's far more complicated. And with this slide, uh, this is actually the view that I have out my office window in Kamloops. Trying, trying to lure more of the students across the Rockies. Um, a shameless attempt. But uh, I wanted to thank the organizers and the sponsors. Uh, it is my uh, greatest pleasure to be here for the 83rd Phil's Lecture. I hope I've given you something to think about. I hope you realize that we are not alone in managing uh, our important forest resource as you are. And uh, I will stop there. And this is the favorite part of my presentation when I stop talking and I will open it up to questions. So thank you very much. All right, we have some time for questions. I'll preface my question with I'm not anti-herbicide or anything. I didn't hear anything about that. The management tool with all the reforestation and intensifying and stuff. What, could you give us a little bit of update what's happening on that PC? Because lately I've seen a lot of email Yeah, absolutely. Good, good question. Uh, we were talking about it at dinner last night. Um, the use of herbicide to um, uh, reduce vegetative competition for our uh, regenerated forests has certainly been something we've had in play for decades. Um, what we're starting to understand is that there is some value in having uh, a component of, and in fact, in some cases, a majority of deciduous trees, depending upon the uh, biogeoclimatic zone that it's in. Um, the use of herbicides is very effective and it does remove the vegetation. We are um, inundated with cards and letters from folks who are opposed to that treatment, that silvicultural tool, um, for all the logical reasons, habitat loss, potential for harm, etc. Um, I have uh, responded to many of these letters by, by um, deferring to the fact that Health Canada is what we follow and using that type of herbicide to the label instructions, we have been told, and, and numerous uh, studies have shown, that is safe. Now, I had this conversation with uh, some faculty members last night, and they said, well, Shane, there's new information out there. <laughs> so I, I think it's like anything. You're going to have uh, 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 scientific evidence that, that pro and con. I've, I've been told by my wife to stop drinking Diet Coke 10 times and then know you can drink because all the Diet Coke you want. This is much more important than that. But it's a silvicultural tool that I think we need to use. It's just that I don't think we should defer to it all the time. In BC, that we are down to uh, doing less than 11,000 hectares a year 
in uh, herbicide treatments. And when you harvest 200,000 hectares a year, that's a very small percentage of what we do. Um, and province-wide, um, I know that there's concentrated areas that, that have that vegetation competition. It is a challenge. Um, I, I'm not sure if Alberta is experiencing the same, but I think we still need to use it as a toolkit, but we have to use it judiciously and sparingly. We have to use it in the right areas. And we have to ensure that uh, we are reflecting the fact that biodiversity is important, that you can have aspen in a free-growing stand, you can have a percentage of deciduous in the stand. Um, I was talking to my silviculture colleague, Brad, who says uh, the simplest thing in Alberta for reforestation is you cut an aspen because you get 25 uh, back. Um, I wish that we had that same kind of um, attitude and, and um, approach in some parts of the province. And so I do think that herbicide is going to be used less. Uh, it needs to be used uh, with more diligence, but I still want it as a silviculture tool. Yes. Um, so with the chained uh, feller, feller bunching, are you concerned about soil erosion and soil stability over the long term on those steeper slopes? Absolutely. Um, the, the standards for soil uh, degradation and soil protection don't change just because you're using uh, new technology and in fact it's one of the reasons that we're um, using that technology Th to use conventional skidders to get that uh, th that timber off of those slopes would cause way more uh, damage to build more road to get to those areas rather than skidding causes way more permanent damage so I think the offset is if you use new technology um, even if in those circumstances, you're getting a slight increase in soil disturbance over the larger block, but you're reducing the amount of permanent road access that you need to build. I think that offset is worth it. Um, and it's also a situation where, because our timber supply, if you remember the graph, the allowable annual cut is going down. Um, the allowable annual cut is based on the entire timber harvesting land base, including some of the steeper slopes that we think you can manage. If licensees can't get to that timber, Essentially, they're not utilizing the full AAC, and in current circumstances in BC especially, we need to use the full AAC. We need to access the full AAC just because it's keeping communities going, because it is going down. So if we can use some of that new technology to do that, I think it's a, it's a good trade-off. BC has a price on carbon. Are any of your forest companies actually receiving money for sequestration of carbon at this point? Gosh, I'm, I'm not even sure I can answer that question. Um, I have some BC colleagues in the room that might be able to answer it, if they would be brave enough to. We can move up. <laughs> and I'm not looking over in the direction of anybody in particular. <laughs> we'll leave that to the reception. Yeah, OK. Thanks. There's no sequestration credits, um, but there are, there are programs under the energy program that come to the BCR getting some, I would su suggest, credits for, but they're part of larger, broader scale initiatives to that same, uh, for the same outcome, if you will. But sequestration, no. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Mark Thomas, Chief Forester from Tolco, a very good friend, and he rides a Harley Davidson. <laughs> Yes. I have to ask a question about your approved seed that you put up there at eighty-five thousand dollars for ten kilos, if I got that mm -hmm. correct. Um, what would be the gain expectation on a seed lot such as that? So the value, how much are you willing to pay? How much gain do you need to make that kind of investment worthwhile? Yeah, and I think right now I think our, our average is 17 and we're looking to get up around 20%. So if you get 20% volume gain over all how many seedlings were you planting? 1.1 million seedlings. And you get 20% volume gain. I think it more than pays for that increased in uh, cost of the seed. So we're, we're, we're quite confident that we're getting maximum value from that improved seed to be used across BC, which is why it's mandatory uh, to use the Class A seed before you go to Class B. So with the, the new guidelines on where seed transfer happens and how it happens with climate change, do you see advantages by having seed coming out of these orchards to play with, being able to manipulate with parents or contributing 
best adapted for Regis than the Me Too. Any thoughts about the use of those orchards for addressing your climate change challenges today? Yeah, absolutely. The, I mean, we've got the challenge of, uh, and we have some companies in, in the room that are uh, very much involved in, in nurseries and, and uh, uh, orchard production as well, but um, the investment that we're putting into finding the right parent trees are doing more than just making sure that they adapt to climate change. They're, they're finding pest resistance. We've got uh, parents that are producing seed that show uh, resistance to deer browse for cedar. Um, uh, we've got um, uh, a, a tremendous number of uh, pests uh, that we're, um, uh, the spruce weevil for instance, um, white pine blister rust. I mean, these are areas of forestry generation that challenge us each and every day. So um, it's, it's a combination of being able to ensure that the seed that we're producing is going to grow the best where, it's, where the seedling is planted, but also having those other traits that can make it a viable seedling. Um, and especially in a situation where some of this seed is gonna be used to produce seedlings that, that produce um, stands that might be left for a period of time to sequester carbon. We want those trees to have the greatest chance of not only being established, but to be there for a long time. And by using that uh, genetically improved seed, I think we're doing that. Did I mention forest genetics is the most important thing foresters can do? <laughs> okay. Are there drinks available at the poster session? Because I'm gonna. <laughs> Yes, sir. You, you mentioned in one of your slides you're on social license. It was a bullet in one of your slides you were on and over lunch. It uh, Dean Lee kind of challenged you again or asked you guess around the, the role of the Vancouver multi million dollar penthouse suite in impacting forestry and forest management. What's the role of the ministry in supporting that dialogue around the social license and the role, the role of forests? And you see how, how would you rule? How do you rule? So um, being an uh, employee of the province, um, uh, we serve at the pleasure of the government of the day. And uh, sometimes those governments have different mandates and different focus areas. And uh, thankfully they don't shift 180 degrees, but I know that uh, some of my licensees in the room will say that there are times when the forest industry is um, the darling of government and sometimes it's not. And I think that's the challenge, is trying to find that, that even keel, um, um, middle of the road part where um, people understand the value of the forest, not only as um, an economic driver, but also as a, um, uh, a stewardship um, uh, component. Um, as the deputy chief forester, I make decisions on allowable annual cuts across the province. And so my decision is not so much how much to harvest. It's really how much do we do to sustain that forest. Harvesting is one piece of that. And I think that's the social license that we in government are trying to achieve. We want to make sure that we're making the right decisions to ensure that there's enough forest within the timber harvesting land base to be used for the economic uh, components, but also for the caribou, for indigenous interests, for recreation, for water, for carbon sequestration. Um, Social license is, I think, a term that gets overused a little bit. Um, I would say that it's more uh, in ensuring that the social interest in sustainable forestry practices is something that is universal. And that's what we're trying to achieve within the Office of the Chief Forester with all the things that we're trying to manage. And I would suggest that Alberta is trying to do the same thing. So how do you carry that message out? I appreciate what you just said, 100% agree. So you all know what's working very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we kind of refer to it, um, you know, it's the, uh, um, the penthouse in Vancouver Suites is a good, is a good uh, moniker for it. Um, I don't know that each and every person that has an opinion about forestry is going to have the same level of knowledge on its impacts and its influences. Uh, we were talking at, at lunch about that very or actually it was um, the fourth year class this morning was telling me, they were asking me about the role of uh, social media in forestry and I said it is unbelievably important. 
um, we have to get the message out. If you look at uh, the BC wildfire um, social media in the summertime, um, my youngest daughter works for the BC wildfire service as a communications um, assistant, where she gets it from, I don't know. Um, and so she's trying to uh, get out in front of things. She's, she's on Twitter, she's on Facebook, she's on um, all the other social media platforms to get information out. When someone sees a smoke on a hillside and they're texting their neighbors and they send a tweet to the Forest Service saying, why aren't you dealing with it? There's someone actioning that right away. Either saying we've already got 10 calls on it and we've got air tankers on the way, we've got initial attack crews on the way. So it's communicating out to people that we are managing their resource in the most appropriate manner. And I use wildfire as an example because it's upfront, it's immediate, it's people want to know that you're managing their forests. Uh, there's people that want to know that you're protecting their communities. Someone living in Oak Bay may not have the same uh, desire around the rapidity of that um, response, but they do want to know what we're doing about old growth. They want to know what we're doing about caribou. They want to know what we're doing about indigenous rights. And I think ensuring that we're getting the message out as much as we can is important. I I'm not convinced that we do it um, at, uh, to, the, to the fullest. Uh, it's probably one of the most important things we do, but it's probably, again, when you look at the demographics, <laughs> it's the forest, yeah. Dealing with the public is the second most important thing we do. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Um, we, uh, we do have to um, spend more time addressing uh, the public's interests, but when you look at those demographics, and I'm not kidding when I say I struggle with my iPhone, we need the next generation of foresters and forest technicians to embrace this new paradigm of get the information out, get it out quick. And that's why we're hiring uh, these new grads because they can come into our world and start to communicate and start to get the word out and get to those people in downtown Vancouver way more than we ever did and probably with tools that we're not even aware of. Jane, have, oh. have you had any success engaging indigenous communities with uh, the commercial side of forestry in BC? Do they have any quota holders? Absolutely. Yeah, we've got a number of First Nation tenure holders. We've got a number of First Nation partnerships with uh, current licensees. Um, you know, my shout out to Tolco. They have a history of working with First Nations in the interior of BC that, uh, you know, has a reputation bar none. Uh, early, um, uh, frequent engagement, um, uh, revenue sharing opportunities, employment opportunities. Those are all tools, but one of the major tools is, is making sure that First Nations have access to the timber. So we have a First Nation woodland license program, area-based program where First Nations actually get area-based uh, timber to manage. Um, few First Nations have sawmilling capabilities, so whenever you get a First Nation with a forest tenure, there's immediately a partnership that needs to take place with a licensee to ensure that that wood is uh, being processed. So lots of examples of it. Um, more to come, I'm sure, with this new DRIP Act and, and how we work with, uh, with First Nations. But again, with 203 First Nations in our province, there's ones that are very much um, capacity to be forest managers, and there are ones that just really want to be acknowledged for the fact that this land was theirs, and they want to make sure that the resources coming from that land, there's a percentage of those resources that come back to their community. And we can do both those things. I think we can do both of them better. I'll let you do the air traffic control, yeah, Brad. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I would like to congratulate you for having so many different types of research in place in the digital forest and the all the technology industry. That is really, really cool. I think it's a very nice process. My question is, I would like you to take us a little bit backward. On the figure that you show, the, the air force of every impacted by different species of insects, very long you grab, uh, around 32,000 seems to be really critical point Yeah, good question. I think, um, I think it caught us a little off guard uh, in terms of our being able to have the infrastructure and the planning to address the infestation, especially the mountain pine beetle infestation. Um, I recall 
I was a district manager in, um, in Kamloops in 2003, and we were already uh, ramping up for salvage. We were, uh, as you might imagine, getting from uh, the point of identifying a stand of trees that needs to be salvaged to actually getting the cutting permit to do it takes an unbelievable amount of time. Just ask my licensee friends. It is a, a ton of time. And, and there's time you have to consult uh, with First Nations and the public. You have to put together your plans. You have to advertise them. You have to have them reviewed. You have to have them approved. You have to have your stumpage rate determined. From the time that you actually identify where that stand is to the time you actually harvest, it could be two years. And that's where I think a lot of the delay took place. And the beetles weren't waiting for us. They were just going, and we were doing our best to try and catch up. And unfortunately, I think we had to play catch up from that point forward. Uh, the infestation uh, started um, in some of our protected areas. <coughs> Pardon me. So uh, that was another issue is that the beetle was starting to percolate in some of our parks. There was no provision to go in and harvest those areas. There was no provision to go in and deal with the beetle, but whether it was fall and burn or salvage. And so I think there was just this massive explosion in some parts of the province where the beetle came out of the parks and started to get into the crown land. And uh, we just did our best to keep up, but it was, um, I think, too little too late. And we've learned from that. We're hoping that we can, by way of that, help our friends in Alberta uh, deal with the infestation that's now crossing, crossing the mountains and coming into your area. That was the part that the part piece, the, the most recent outbreak you have spruce beetle, right? What was the attitude? What was the response that was happening last couple <clears throat> years? So because the spruce beetle is a different uh, critter, it, it is very slow and it, it doesn't um, impact every tree. You'll have, as, as the slide showed, you'll have a dead tree, and then three green trees, and then a dead tree, and three green trees. So it's, it's insidious. It's there, but it doesn't really show itself until much later in the process. I think what we're looking at now is we're seeing um, infestation in, in what we're um, calling trace amounts in certain parts of our forests, but in other parts more severe. And I think what we're trying to do is use the tools that we have to try and address the beetle without compromising what in some landscapes is the last vestige of timber, of standing timber, of mature timber in that valley. The other part is the access. I mentioned there's uh, timber that's really starting to show infestation that is so far away from existing logging roads that it's just not economically viable for a company to build the road in to go and pick out individual trees. There's just no way in. So, I think the public have signaled to us that they're no longer going to accept the larger cutting to address a smaller infestation. So we have to figure out a way of um, being more meticulous, being more surgical in the removal of the spruce. But right now, market conditions and such, I don't think are going to make for uh, that opportunity as much as we'd hoped. We are salvaging. We are focusing attention in the, in the areas that we can get to. Um, and we're hoping that through those efforts and with weather, and with other agents, maybe we'll see the, the spruce beetle go down. It's not anywhere near the mountain pine beetle in terms of its, its um, uh, growth rates and its, its um, infestation, but it's something we have to pay attention to for sure. Okay, we have time for one more question here. So how about uh, here? Thank you. I have to say you've done good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if there's any harvesting going on in the Great Bear Rainforest, it's being done by the First Nations. Uh, it is very much an area that is being uh, protected for the values uh, of, of uh, old growth and also that very iconic um, Kermode bear. Um, but it is, uh, it's part of that calculation of how much old growth we're, we're reserving. Um, and it's, it's balancing those values. It's how much does the Great Bear Rainforest mean for the public to be preserved versus how much does it mean for the industry or for the economics of the province? In this case, the decision was made to reserve it. There is some harvesting that takes place, but again, it's with the First Nation that's in the area. Um, but there's, as I said, if we've got 33% of our old growth protected, is that enough? 
Is it, is it not enough? Um, it's a question that I don't think there's a real answer for. I just think we have to balance. It's about balance and it's about stewardship. And uh, sometimes the two don't mix depending on what part of the province you're in. Thanks, Dr. Murphy. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, a couple of things before we uh, wrap up here. Um, one is we will continue with the poster session afterwards. Um, so back in Ag4, please join us for the, uh, uh, the guys student posters. Um, another one is our next bill speaker is going to be in the first Thursday of November. So as we heard earlier, this is the 50th anniversary of our, forestry, of our undergraduate forestry program in 2020. So our next speaker, we have Dr. Uh, Terry Sherrick from Michigan Tech, who's going to be talking about undergraduate forestry education. It seems rather fitting to uh, have those two uh, together. And finally, I would just really like to thank Shane. So uh, Shane has been here, came in last night, um, and was able to, he's been a busy guy, I think. <laughs> um, this morning he was in talking with an undergraduate class. Uh, we had lunch, talking with different faculty members, different uh, uh, sponsors of the event here today. Uh, and afterwards, we're going back to the, uh, to the poster presentation with the graduate students. So on behalf of our faculty, students, and all of our sponsors, I'd really like to thank you for the great talk today. It was really insightful, and it's nice to hear uh, all the challenges. And it's, we often think that our problems are unique. I think you've really highlighted the, um, the commonalities and how we can learn from each other and what's going on in different parts of the world. That was really, uh, um, that was really great. So thank you very much. Perfect. Very happy to be back at the best university in Canada. <laughs>